Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Topai. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live. I am your host every week here on Hernia Talk Tuesdays. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. I am your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Thank you for joining me. Many of you are here via Zoom and others through my Facebook page as a Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai. Thank you also for following me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. As always, this session, as well as all prior sessions, will be put on my YouTube channel. Please do follow me and subscribe, and then you will always know when these sessions are on. So as I've mentioned before, I like to kind of use a lot of um, my week's worth of patients as inspiration for topics for our um, our weekly Hernia Talk live sessions. And lately, I've been having a lot of patients that are referred to me for hernia mesh removal uh, that may or may not need it, actually. And others that think they need a mesh removal. Um, and some who definitely need mesh removal and are told they shouldn't or mustn't or et cetera. And what's really interesting to me is the sheer number of kind of misinformation that's out there about mesh removal. I must say that it's a operation that we really were not doing until probably the late, I would say, late 1990s. Dr. Parviz Amid was really the um, main surgeon, and he's actually in Los Angeles and went, used to work at my hospital, Cedar sinai But um, it was Dr. Parviz Amid that started talking about the importance of um, good operations and in doing good operations of getting, of sometimes needing to redo it and, and use um, uh, mesh removal as a way of kind of re redoing things. And he invented the triple neurectomy and a bunch of other things. He is the original surgeon who partnered with Dr. Lichtenstein, Irving Lichtenstein, also at my hospital, Cedar sinai um, where they invented the Lichtenstein hernia repair. So there's a lot of history uh, that kind of is interrelated. But specifically with mesh removal, it was so important to know your anatomy before you just go in there and remove mesh. This was for ingual hernias. And now we do these open laparoscopic, robotic. We do it for ingual hernias and abdominal wall hernias. Many of you know, most of my surgical cases are revisional cases and many of them are mesh removals. Um, I posted a picture of some mesh that I removed last week. And in basically in doing so, you kind of gain more experience. And what's fascinating to me is so much mythology out there about mesh removal. Um, I commonly have people uh, come to me saying that they were told not to have their mesh removed which may be the right answer, it may or may not be, but the reason given is because you'll die, um, you will lose your leg, you will lose a testicle, um, uh, you will lose all this muscle, you know, you'll never be able to be put back together again. They're told it's impossible to remove the mesh. Um, all of those are, are not true, basically. So it's never impossible to remove mesh. Now there's risk to it, there's risk towards different mesh removals, depending on where the mesh is and, and the patient's like risk for surgery, et cetera. But to say that you cannot actually remove mesh is not accurate. All mesh can be removed. There's just risk associated with each, each, op each uh, proposed operation. Next is this whole idea that you're going to die um, if you have mesh removal. Now, mesh removal is surgery. It, typically requires general anesthesia. However, if it's in the groin and done under open, as an open procedure, I don't use general anesthesia. I usually use IV sedation. But short of that risk and the potential risk of any surgery, including mesh removal surgery, of having complications, infection, heart attack, blood clots, et cetera, um, in and of itself, mesh removal surgery is not considered a highly um, more like high, an operation with high mortality. People are not expected to die of this operation, which is why we recommend it. Why would you recommend a surgery if people die from it? So 
that this kind of doesn't make sense when people are told, oh, they're just, uh, you know, it's very high risk, they will die. That said, I must say that maybe in the hands of a non-specialist, it's not the safest operation because there are nerves, critical structures like intestines, bladder, major vessels, all of these are in the way potentially of mesh removal. And therefore, if you are not the cleanest surgeon with the most delicate hands and the best anatomy knowledge, then you can definitely cause damage. And I'll, I'll review some cases that I've had actually this week alone. <laughs> Today's Tuesday, just today. Um, uh, that I'll share with you and some op some phone calls I've got some from some friends who um, are like you know we we don't do this for a living can we send the patient to you so that's all really good plus I know many of you have questions so I'm really looking forward to answering your questions I got about 20 questions sent in for today's session alone so we'll try and get to as many as possible I really appreciate the fact that you guys um, do send me questions so I do appreciate that so let's, you know what, let's start with some questions. Here's a live one. How resorbable is phasix mesh? Phasix mesh, first of all, is a synthetic absorbable mesh. It is considered to um, be absorbed at about 18 months. Does it disappear completely or do, do persisting remnants usually remain? Depends on the patient. The expectation is that the mesh disappears completely. I have operated on patients that have had the mesh, you know, two years prior, and there's this kind of like gritty, um, like fiberglassy um, remnant from it that I saw. Um, in some patients, things that are like, what do you call it, um, absorbable, really only absorb if your body decides to choose to absorb it. And infrequently, there are absorbable meshes that are so synthetic in nature that the body does not absorb it. Um, it actually encapsulates it. And we've seen that with some really poor quality biologic meshes that were out there. Can persisting remnants be removed? Yes. Asking because I have an autoimmune condition. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, so I'll give you my answer. Uh, in my experience, all synthetic meshes, including the synthetic absorbables, which includes phasix, are inflammatory in nature. And therefore, I do not use them in patients with autoimmune or inflammatory disorders. The more kind of cadaverish like biologic tissues tend to have lower inflammatory uh, potential than the synthetic products. And um, even in the biologics, the more process and synthetic -y the biologic mesh, the more likely you are to react to it um, and have an inflammatory reaction. So if you ask the company, they have tons of studies that show that the, the mesh actually is low in, in inflammatory potential and has lower inflammation than it's um, the, the other biologics. Uh, I'm not a specialist enough to know how to accurately decipher that data. Um, I trust that their scientists are, are you know, accurate in what they're saying, but um, I have used um, phasix before in a clinical trial only, um, and the patients are fine. Uh, I do not use it in patients with autoimmune disorders yet because I don't see that there's any evidence to show that it's going to be tolerated any better than synthetic mesh in the short term. And then also, I would say that um, the, the, how should I explain this? The, I have had a couple of patients, uh, and maybe you were one of them as well, uh, who have reacted to phasix mesh because it does have an inflammatory potential uh, to it, and they just feel it. And waiting for over that 18 plus months for it to go away is usually not enough because their quality of life is poor during that time. So I hope that's helpful. Um, so am I saying that I will use true biologic mesh with uh, autoimmune? Uh, yes, I either do not use a pure synthetic meshes. Of course, you know, everyone's a little bit different, but if there's 
if, if there's a good choice, I prefer to either use no mesh in patients with known autoimmune disorders or to use um, biologic mesh uh, or a hybrid. So it depends on the type of disorder that the patient may have, but the hybrid meshes, which is autoimmune plus some synthetic, um, dramatically reduces the amount of synthetic exposure and therefore the least amount of inflammatory reaction and potential autoimmune exacerbation. That said, there's no real science behind what I'm saying. It's mostly by experience. And even with the hybrid meshes, um, I have one patient who um, we believe did react to that mesh. So, you know, um, we don't have great science to say what's best. Now, for example, this week I have had a patient, um, autoimmune disorder in her daughter, autoimmune disorder in her mom and her aunt. Um, she herself does not have autoimmune disorder. And she actually asked for mesh. And she said, what do you think about that? And I explained to her, women, thin people, young uh, people, people with known autoimmune disorders or a strong family history of autoimmune disorders, and she fits three of those criteria, um, tend to be more likely than the average per patient to develop a reaction to synthetic mesh. Now, what's that higher risk? I don't know. Is it 10% higher? Is it 200% higher? Is it 20 times higher? I don't really know. Nobody knows. We just know it's a higher risk. And um, once our pub our paper gets published, you'll, you'll read that in our experience, the chances of you reacting to mesh if you have an autoimmune or inflammatory kind of tendency, um, it's significantly higher than not. But there are patients with mesh in them that have lupus and other autoimmune disorders that are, are doing just fine. So um, if a patient wants to have mesh in them, I don't think that's dangerous to do, understanding that they may have to have the mesh removed if they react to it. Um, that said, I personally feel that less is more. And so I don't actively recommend mesh, synthetic mesh use unless the patient um, specifically ask for that and understands the risks and benefits of it. Okay, next question. What symptoms would warrant a mesh removal? I have hip pain, no issues with hips on a recent scan, and irritation to the genital femoral nerve, but no relief from steroid injection into the nerve, slight benefit from PRP treatment. So it sounds like you have an inguinal hernia repair with mesh, and you have hip pain and genital femoral nerve irritation. The question is, where was where is your mesh? Is it anterior or posterior? Is it done laparoscopically or is it done anteriorly? Because all of these can be actually related to um, the mesh interacting, like as a fold or a hernia recurrence or an entrapment of the nerve. So it if it was done, sounds like it was done laparoscopically, which means the genital femoral nerve is at risk of injury. Um, and not sure why you would have hip pain, but you may actually have a hernia recurrence. So that's something that needs to be worked up. If you have a hernia recurrence, that's not a mesh problem necessarily. and does not need mesh removal. Most hernia recurrences do not need mesh removal. But if it's a entrapment of the nerve by the mesh, like the mesh was placed too low, let's say, um, or the mesh was folded and that's why you're having hip, hip pain, then mesh removal would help you. So mesh removal is only helpful um, if it's the mesh is infected, if the mesh mechanically is a problem, like it's folded or impinging on something, and or if um, you're reacting to the mesh. So if your nerve pain and your hip pain is due to a mechanical problem in the mesh, great. But if you do imaging and the imaging shows that you just have a hernia recurrence and that's why you would have the hip pain and the general nerve type pain, then I would just fix the hernia recurrence and not deal with the older mesh. I hope that's helpful. All right, lots of questions, guys. Lots and lots and lots of questions. Let's do some more. So based on your experience, what is the incidence of mesh complications requiring mesh removal? Um, good question. So in general, um, mesh removal is not necessary for almost all hernia-related complications. Oh, here's another question. How would you compare the incidence of mesh-related complications 
to the incidence of post-operative complications unrelated to mesh. Right, so most hernia complications are related to hernia recurrence. And so those almost never need mesh removal. Um, mesh removal, like I mentioned, is either done because the mesh is infected, because there's a mechanical problem with the mesh where it's folded and impinging or pressing on something. We call that a meshoma. Um, or if you're reacting to the mesh as an inflammatory or autoimmune reaction. Those are the top three reasons to remove mesh. We actually wrote a paper called Why We Remove Mesh. <laughs> um, every so often we have to remove mesh because there's a hernia that's recurred and the mesh is in the way, but that's not common, especially for the groin. It may be a little bit more common for, for ventral or incisional hernias where you want a clean slate. But my point is this, um, fortunately, most people do not need mesh removals when they have a hernia complication. And fortunately, mesh complications are not common. Um, they're the number one cause of, of pain or problems is usually uh, a hernia recurrence and mesh complication may be the third or fourth reason. Um, so that's actually good news, fortunately. Let's see, what are the questions? Oh, this is a long one. Uh, let me read this. I've been told by multiple mesh explant specialist surgeons that my case is extremely complicated, that my mesh cannot be removed, and that if it was removed, it could cause additional nerve or muscle damage, and another extended mesh would need to be implanted. I mean, that may or may not be totally true. Depends on... I don't completely agree with that, basically. Uh, I have extended J&J &J polypropylene proline mesh put in via component separation repair with oblique muscles elevated and used to reinforce the mesh. Okay, so you basically had a, a component separation wish mesh. Those are tricky to remove, but it still can be removed if you need it. Um, let's see, the mesh goes hip to hip and rib cage to pubic bone. Okay, so it sounds like you had what's called a giant hernia or a loss of domain and you need a component separation and huge mesh that covers basically your entire abdominal wall. It was put in after abdominal wall denervation that happened because of a deep flap reconstruction surgery causing my rectus muscle to atrophy. I had no autoimmune issues prior to the mesh. I now have Asia syndrome from the mesh and multiple autoimmune diseases diagnosed. What can be done in my situation? Can the mesh be explanted without being replaced? Okay, so here is where the risk benefit ratio is. You're in a very difficult situation because number one, it's a large piece of mesh, but definitely the mesh can be removed. However, your, the underlying problem for which they put the mesh sounds like it's not so much for like a hernia, but because you lost your abdominal wall function because of a deep flap gone wrong. A deep flap, it's spelled D-I-E-P. It's one of the different types of reconstruction flaps where they use the abdominal wall tissue to reconstruct breast tissue usually. Um, so let's say a female has breast cancer and they um, get a mastectomy, which means that their entire breast tissue is removed. And then they use their own natural tissue from the abdominal wall to recreate a breast. That's the most typical scenario for a deep flap reconstruction, deep spelled D-I-E-P. Um, so if that deep flap is performed in a way that, that the nerves are injured to your abdominal wall, then you can lose function of the abdominal wall and, um, the operation she had was exactly the right operation. Unfortunately, she reacted to the mesh. So reacting to the mesh, you just have to remove it. Um, I would do allergy testing first to make sure that that's uh, what you're having is indeed related um, to the, the meshes. The allergy testing is not perfect, but it is something that can add additional information. So let's say you do allergy testing and it shows that you kind of have a hyper reaction to let's say polypropylene. Um, what that means is that uh, you're not going to do very well with uh, any synthetic mesh. That said, in someone that has so much autoimmune disorder, um, you and the thought is it's it's since the mesh placement, and, and usually it's within a year of the mesh placement when these symptoms start, then removal of the mesh may be what you need and just understand that you're going to look pregnant and you may have back pain and abdominal wall pain because the belly is going to look really thin walled, but 
that's better than having an autoimmune disorder. Understanding also, we don't know enough about these mesh implant illnesses and the autoimmune disorders that it may spark. So are you prone to an autoimmune disorder and the mesh kind of brought that up earlier? In which case, removing the mesh may not get rid of your autoimmune disorder. Um, why are you removing the mesh? Are you understanding that the mesh may be removed at high morbidity and complication rate? And on top of that, you may not feel any better and your autoimmune will be the same. So these are all things to consider where the risks and benefits of the mesh removal need to be outweighed. Um, the, the risks need to be outweighed by the benefits. So let's say you're having chronic fatigue, joint pain, hair loss, um, uh, numbness and tingling in the fingers, and you remove the mesh and the pain, all that goes away, great. But if it doesn't go away because you actually now have lupus, then you know those are you just have to treat the medical problem. It's a very very difficult uh, problem. So I agree with your doctors. It's not like oh yeah, I'll just remove the mesh and see how it is. Um, it's highly highly morbid. Um, uh, but if your quality of life is such that it deserves that, then it's still uh, something that I would still offer. The other option too is to consider putting in a biologic um, tissue, but I would not do it in one stage. I would remove all the mesh, see how you do. If you do fine, then I would start introducing biologic implant um, to see if that helps you. And then may, if you're feeling really good about it, then consider a hybrid mesh, but you may still react to that. Next question, can you give a percentage of mesh complications that might occur during an inguinal open procedure? Very low. So mesh complications, so all complications are kind of in that like 10 to 15% range. And then mesh complications depends on, let's see, what is it, inguinal open procedure? Okay, so of all the operations, inguinal open procedure has the highest risk of mesh complications and laparoscopic or robotic uh, mesh procedures. And even then it should be a fraction of that. So maybe 10% of 10%. So maybe 1% complication or so. Um, of course, it depends on the type of operation, the surgeon's skill, your own risk factors, um, the type of hurting you had, et cetera. Okay. Next question. Are the myths of death maiming or other extreme complications after mesh removal completely fictional or do they have some truth from the standpoint of an unspecialized surgeon and how do the odds of being worse after mesh removal differ with specialized hernia surgeons okay this is kind of why i have hernia talk lab and herniatalk.com because i feel that hernias don't get enough um specialty attention and therefore people go to their local doctor and get a hernia repaired. And then when they have a complications, they stay with that local doctor um, because A, they don't feel like they need to go to a specialist. It's just a hernia. And B, their hernia surgeon doesn't feel like it needs specialty, special attention because it's just a hernia. Those are both false. And I'll tell you, it's because you keep getting complication after complication. I had a patient today, perfect scenario. She had a surgery, got a hernia. They didn't understand the hernia was partially due to the fact that she's pre-diabetic, morbidly obese, and uses nicotine. And then what did they do? They did a hernia repair, which was the wrong operation to begin with, um, used too small of a, of a mesh, and uh, did not overlap the mesh enough with the defect that she had. Um, and guess what? Hernia recurred. She's still smoking, um, morbidly obese, and um, and uh, pre-diabetic. So she has a second surgery. All these, by the way, non non-specialized surgeons. Second surgeon goes in there, tries laparoscopic, can tries open, does does again the wrong technique. So instead of suturing the mesh, tacks the mesh. Probably uses too many tacks. I'm not sure, but we'll have to see. Now she's in chronic pain and, and so on. So um, yes, the truth is in the hands of a specialist, all operations are done better, whether that's heart surgery or transplant or hernia surgery. And once you have a complication, for sure, 
the next operation would be better performed by a specialist because specialists like me and others, 80% of what I do is treating other compl people's complications, which means that's my specialty within a specialty. Whereas if you go to your surgeon who does gallbladders and breast surgery and colon surgery and, um, and hernia surgery on the side, and it's 10%, 20% of their, of their work, they are not a specialist in that, within that specialty, and therefore don't understand the intricacies and how not to like repeat the same mistake. So giving the example of my earlier patient, she still has all the risk factors for hernia recurrence. And on top of that, she keeps having non-specialty operations where the technique is not optimal. The size of the mesh is too small. The technique of the repair is too small. The overlap with the, the fascia is too small. And these are all little extra, you know, bits that add that add to things. So I'll give you an example. If um, if you buy a car, you want to buy a car from a manufacturer that sells cars all the time, and has gone through the learning curve of of knowing like tire pressures and and where the engine should be. And you know, if you put the engine a little bit further back or further front, it makes a difference in a car. Same is true about hernias. Um, and why specialty care is so important. And the good news is there are specialty doctors. They're, they're not in every state. Um, if you go to herniatalk.com, we talk about specialty surgeons all the time. So it's possible that in your town there, or near your town, there may be a mention of a hernia surgeon that we recommend. On this show, the, the Hernia Talk Live, I bring hernia specialists from all over the world who talk about hernia surgery and what they do. And you can kind of learn and about them and see if you like their personality and maybe go see them. Because uh, everyone that I talk to, I, I, I have great faith in and, and would um, definitely refer to. You can also go to the American Hernia Society webpage and there are there's a find a surgeon section that um, has surgeons that at least have some interest. They're not, they may not necessarily be specialists, but at least have some interest in hernias. So that's kind of my take on, on that. Uh, let's see, here's another question. Not sure if there's time for another question, but if so, yes, there is. What are the conditions left behind after mesh removal, is the site seriously scarred, deranged, et cetera? And how does this affect prospects for a successful second surgery? That's actually a good question because we had a similar question. Um, let's see. Yeah, is it true that after mesh removal, you will never be the same as you were before mesh was implanted? So both of those are a good question. They, they in, intend to say the same thing. So yes, the mesh is, is very much um, stuck to uh, whatever tissue it's stuck to. Usually that's muscle, sometimes peritoneum or fascia, and sometimes it's critical structure. And th those are not considered critical structures usually because you can remove the mesh and shave it off and have very, very, very little muscle or fascia um, that gets destroyed. So for example, I had a patient, uh, I think about a month ago. So she is a lovely lady. She's had, I think three hernia surgeries <laughs> and each time they put more mesh in and more tacks and so on. And just so much, so much, um, what do you call it? scar tissue and tax. And I think I took out 50 tax in her. Uh, and it's ridiculous how much mesh was in there. And the hernia was really, really large and she, the mesh was infected. So I had to absolutely remove the mesh um, without um, kind of damaging as much tissue as, as possible. But at the same time, I was like, shoot, she's got such a huge hernia. If I remove all this mesh, how much tissue is going to come with it? And how much tissue do I have left? And guess what? I mean, we we're maybe lucky, I don't know. <laughs> but we removed so much mesh, a lot of it infected. And we did it in a way 
to minimize, minimize, minimize how much muscle and fascia was destroyed. Some was destroyed, but not enough to matter because we were still able to put her back together again. And I used a biologic mesh in her because uh, synthetic mesh uh, would have been not the best choice in the, I believe, in the face of uh, um, active mesh infection. So she's great. She's all healed. And for the first time in two or three years, she's got no pus coming out of her wound and no pain and her hernia is repaired and her wound is closed. So really, really happy patient. But, um, you know, that's a story where you can remove tons of mesh and still have issues that, um, that uh, make it so that some of the, your tissues will be destroyed. Uh, let's see, where would a patient feel pain related to fixation to Cooper's ligament? Usually that, that's not painful. Can you use thigh crease or pubic bones to help a patient localize that type of pain? Um, I mean, Cooper's ligament is on the bone and usually fixation to the bone does not cause pain. Can mesh be fixated safely to Cooper's ligament without causing pain? Yes. How long does it take for fibrous ingrowth into the mesh to acquire 100% of expected strength? So that's a good question. We believe for most meshes within the first three months is the strongest it gets and it kind of maximizes at about one year. Um, so the maximum, the, it peaks at three months and then between three months to a year is when um, your strength is the best. How long does it take for mesh to incorporate into surrounding tissues? So within the first three days, so this is synthetic mesh we're talking about, not biologic mesh, because that takes that takes about eight months. But for um, to completely incorporate and three months to be incorporate enough that I don't stress out about you. But for synthetic mesh, it's usually within the first three days, it starts to incorporate into the surrounding tissue. Can mesh ever be removed without resulting in immediate or, or delayed hernia? Yes. So usually if, if mesh is removed in the face of an infection, so there's a mesh infection, then when you remove the mesh, there's so much inflammation and scar tissue that's laid down as a reaction to the, to the infection that you're not going to see a hernia. Often that's the case. And because of that, we usually just remove infected mesh and don't need to fix a hernia in the case of the most inguinal hernias and most small hernias. In the larger hernias, that's not usually the situation because there's a huge gap, but um, that's the most common situation. Also, if you have a small hernia and for whatever reason you need to have the mesh removed, that there may be enough scar tissue to fill that. In both cases, however, eventually you're going to get a hernia. Less likely with the infection situation because the amount of scar tissue laid is so thick and angry. But in the situation where you just remove mesh without infection and it's a small hernia, that scar tissue that fills that hernia is not enough to last you. So in the next year or two, you may expect a hernia to recur. Oh, here's my patient who follower from England says I'm in England which by the way, I will be in England next month. So October, I can't wait. I'm in England and um, uh, I lost 23 kilos for my operation and now they moved the goalpost. <laughs> Swimming two miles a day, I've had mesh stuck to my bowels twice, nearly killing me and having tech, et cetera, in my, my hernia, it's huge. Well, congratulations on your weight loss. 23 kilos is a lot. That's like 50 pounds or more which is a lot, a lot, a lot. I regularly refer my patients to surgical weight loss because it's just so hard to lose that much weight. It takes a long, long time, which means your quality of life is diminished during the time when you're trying to lose the weight. So surgical weight loss is often the best choice. Um, but yeah, if the mesh is stuck to your intestines and tox and so on, that all should be removed. And the best thing to do is to reduce all your risk factors before surgery. So stop your nicotine, no, no constipation, lose the weight, make sure you don't, not, don't have infections. If you have chronic cough, fix that, get your diabetes under control and then have your mesh removal surgery. How can you check if your mesh is infected? Um, Usually there's a fluid collection associated with it. You have fevers, you're sick, there may be drainage or non-healing wound underneath it. 
the one patient that I was talking to you about, no one told her her mesh was infected. They kept treating this like non-healing wound and draining wound. They kept calling it a draining sinus. Yeah, it's draining a sinus because there's bacteria there. And the reason why there's bacteria there is because the mesh, which is synthetic, is constantly harboring this infection. Unless you remove it, it's not going to go away. Can you explain why the American Hernia Society makes recommendations to not fixate mesh and links to sign repair to the pubic periosteum? And what it what is it that makes the pubic periosteum unique as a pain generator, given that the orthopedist suture periosteum and other uh, sites commonly? Very good question. So this was really Dr. Parvey's Amit's thing. He was dealing with a lot of patients that were um, coming to him with chronic pain. And one of the things he noticed is that there's suture into the periosteum and the bone. And um, uh, he felt that that, and they had a lot of pain specifically over that area and they were getting osteitis pubis. So he felt that that was a technique that was causing problems. And therefore, um, most of us and the European and international consensus papers recommend that we don't put sutures into the peri into the bone. We can just use the periosteum or the, um, the rectus insertion on the, uh, on the periosteum, on the bone to hold our sutures. Now, if you talk to, you're exactly right. If you talk to orthopedic doctors, they suture into the periosteum all the time. So it's unclear if what he was recommending um, has any validity to it. It was based on his observations. And I must say, it's a better technique not to go through the periosteum, but we go to Cooper's ligament all the time and no one cares. So um, you, you pick up on a very, very um, interesting detail. Most doctors would not be able to figure out that detail. And I agree with you, it doesn't make sense. And I do feel it's a better operation, it's cleaner not to go to the periosteum. But the fact is that tons of people will have it go through and it's probably not an issue. Next question. What is the threshold for the pain scale one to 10 um, where you'd consider removing ingle hernia mesh? Oh, well, it would have to affect your quality of life. If it's not affecting your quality of life, then um, that's, you know, depends on what you do for a living and what kind of quality of life you have and what you're willing to, uh, to undergo before committing to surgery. Next, I had mesh removal from diastasis recti and umbilical hernia pair over two and a half years ago. There's no recurrent hernia, but I do have intermittent pain that can be debilitating. What can be the cause? So, uh, oh, you had mesh removal. But if the mesh was removed, I wonder if they put sutures in because if you have sutures in, the pain can be the um, pulling of the sutures. All right, great, great questions, everybody. Okay, we answered that question. Is it correct to say that since the immune system activation always follows mesh implantation and always involves some amount of inflammation, Asia patients, so um, autoimmune or, or autoinflammatory uh, symptoms induced by adjuvant patients are just those patients where the degree of immune system activation and associated inflammation is enough to cause systemic symptoms, i.e. all mesh patients have Asia to some extent, but only a few have symptoms. Okay, so here, this is talking about patients who undergo hernia mesh implantation and react to that implant in a severe enough way that they get an autoimmune or inflammatory systemic response. Hair loss, tingling in the fingers and toes, joint pain, joint swelling, bloating, nausea, vertigo, ringing in the ear, visual changes, problem sleeping, um, uh, chronic fatigue, brain fog. These are all inflammatory systems 
symptoms, excuse me, that we believe are part of the mesh implant illness syndrome. Now, the question is, does everyone really get some type of inflammatory response in the body and others are just, it's just so extreme. I don't think so. We do know that all hernia mesh implants cause inflammation, but it's local inflammation. It's like cutting yourself. If you cut your hand, you're going to get inflammation locally, but your head to toe body is not going to have an inflammatory response necessarily. And that and your normal body should compartmentalize that inflammation strictly to the area where the implant is and not have your whole body go into some extreme inflammatory state. Now, some people um, feel bloated after surgery. Um, that may be from the anesthesia. It can be from the medications. It can be from the IV hydration. They may be constipated, who knows? But in general, no, I don't agree with, um, with that statement. That said, here, I'm super excited because this Friday, I'll be presenting my results and experience with hernia mesh implant illness and allergy testing in that realm um, to Dr. Schoenfeld and his group in Israel, which I'm super excited about because he is the inventor of the Asia syndrome and he has a weekly autoimmune autoimmunity kind of um, conference and I attended it last week it was really great and I hope to present my data this week and have a discussion about it I hope and learn some more and then maybe collaborate with Dr. Schoenfeld on hernia meshes because we need much more much much more data than we currently have um, so I'm super super excited about that Next question, I live in the central part of the United States. Awesome. Every doc tells me the same thing. We cannot operate because it may or will kill you. Yes, but what I say earlier, I believe it's because they are not specialists and they feel they will kill you. Maybe that's true, but you shouldn't be killed in general. I always use the um, analogy like, why would you die from a hernia surgery? We do heart transplants and people don't die. Why would you die from a hernia repair or mesh removal? Anyway, I got in late to your podcast when you were talking about finding a surgeon. Do you know of any surgeons close to the middle of the U.S. I could call? Yes. So first of all, um, last week we talked to, was it last week? Two weeks ago, we talked to Dr. Um, uh, Dr. from Washington University in St. Louis. So I highly recommend you go there. Why am I blanking on his name? Blotnick, Jeffrey Blotnick. <laughs> There's two surgeons, Doctors Jeffrey, actually three surgeons in that group. I've interviewed two of them, um, Dr. Michael Brunt and Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Blotnick. They're in St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri's in the middle. And great surgeon, knows a lot about hernias, a lot about meshes. And we talked about um, different types of meshes. So if you want to watch that YouTube on my YouTube channel from two weeks ago, um, you may be able to, maybe you'll like him and you can call him. Um, what else in the middle? We've talked to, uh, let's see, in Tennessee, um, Dr. Dr. Guy Veller, you can consider, consider him very knowledgeable. Uh, I believe he's in Memphis, I believe. And so uh, at University of Tennessee, or you can just go to herniatalk.com and search for different states and see if they were mentioned in the different discussions. Um, I would recommend traveling if you have the means to travel for your care because that's very, very important. And then um, American Hernia Society, the webpage has uh, a list, find a surgeon. Uh, so just go to AmericanHerniaSociety.org and then there's a list called find a surgeon. You can put in your state and see if anyone in your state at least has an interest in it. But yes, if people are telling you you will die, do not go to them for your hernia mesh removal surgery. Let's see. So are you saying that a second surgery after mesh removal will always be another mesh surgery? No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, in general, 
if you have a hernia recurrence after a hernia repair with mesh, then the hernia recurrence should definitely be with, with mesh, otherwise it's gonna fail. However, if you need mesh removed for a certain purpose, um, let's say infection, let's say chronic pain from the mesh or mesh implant illness, then you may um, undergo a redo hernia repair without mesh, understanding that it's a lesser repair in terms of hernia recurrence. But you know, your situation may be such that it is. Uh, here's a comment. I have found that many surgeons, even hernia surgeons, shy away from mesh removal due to concern over in outcomes. True. Lack of appropriate compensation based on the complexity of, surgery, of the surgery, possible, and or the fact that a surgeon can perform a great number of simple repairs per day. That's very true, actually. So the compensation per time unit for a complex operation is much less for a complex operation than for a simple operation. So if I did five or six inguinal or umbilical hernias in one day, I would make more money than if I did one or two complicated operations. That's just the way that insurance companies work. Um, that said, I admire your willingness to take on these tough cases and your wonderful forum to help those of us in need. Bravo. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. I actually enjoy the mental kind of um, uh, kind of process you have to go through to figure out exactly what's wrong with someone and what's the best operation for them. Is it mesh removal? Is it nerve block? Is it um, medications? I had a lady who came in today and she was thought for sure she needed hernia surgery. I was like, no, I think, I think you have a GI problem. So I have another patient online consult um, also thought that she's got like a hernia, but she doesn't, it's actually a GI problem. So um, I like that kind of opportunity to figure things out and uh, problem solve. Everyone knows I'm a huge, huge, huge problem solving fan. Um, and, you know, the way that my office works is different. Um, we don't really contract with most, uh, with most insurance companies. We can still bill for you, but we don't contract with them because I think that the type of uh, reimbursement that, that they believe in is totally against what I believe in. So I don't, um, not a fan of working with insurance companies because they don't agree that I should be spending my time um, sitting down and figuring out your problem. They just feel like I should just be going hernia, surgery, hernia, surgery, no hernia, no surgery. Like that's not how I work. Pain never went away since ingual surgery from the incision. I feel like it never healed terrible to the touch. Any advice? So very good um, problem to help figure out for you. Basically, if someone has had pain before ingual, ingual surgery, then they have ingual surgery and now they have pain. The question is, tell me exactly what the pain is and how is it different, not just in quantity, but in quality from prior to your surgery. So you had certain quality of pain before surgery, then you had surgery, and now you have this other pain. Is it exactly the same? That means your hernia was not the cause of the, of the, of the um, pain, most likely. Is it different quality. So I still have pain, but it's different than it was before surgery. Then that may be a hernia surgery complication, which can be addressed. Um, that's where this kind of back and forth goes to where we question. And then your physical exam is also very important. And in redo situations, I think it's so important that you have a um, uh, imaging. I think imaging is a, it's a big deal when it comes to revisional surgery. All right, let's go through some more questions. Is acute inflammation that occurs immediately after mesh implant local or systemic? Local. After what amount of time does it subside? Depends on the patient. Usually within days to weeks, usually less than six weeks. Is there any residual long-term local or systemic, systemic chronic inflammation? At the level of the implant, yes. Because of the implant, you'll always have a local chronic inflammation. We showed that in our paper that we published 
on mesh pathology. And we showed every single mesh that we removed had chronic inflammation. That's expected. And if you talk to the um, pathologist, they will say, oh, well, yeah, duh. Even if I remove a, a pacemaker or if I remove a hip implant, the pathology will always show local chronic inflammation, but it should not be having, um, should not uh, have a systemic reaction. Okay, let's go back to the other question about the pain after hernia surgery. It hurts to shave, feels worse afterwards. Okay, so if it hurts to shave, you have a nerve problem. So it's neuropathic pain. And that may be because of just swelling in the area, or it may be because you have nerve entrapment or nerve injury from the hernia repair. So that's something that your doctor needs to figure out which nerve, do nerve blocks and give you nerve medication to see if it goes away and determine if it's a reversible problem. In other words, is the nerve entrapped in scar tissue? Can they release scar tissue? Or is a nerve injured or eroded by the mesh, in which case a nerve should be perhaps destroyed? Okay, if pain post-surgery is similar in location and quality, but much more severe, constant, and easier to provoke than pre-op and not related to the surgical intervention sutures. Hold on. If pain post-surgery is similar in location and quality, but much more severe, constant, and easier to provoke than pre-op, not related to the surgical intervention and sutures and or mesh. Okay, so, um, right. So exactly. If you have a certain amount of pain and you have a surgery, hernia, mesh, sutures, whatever, and post-op you have the same quality of pain, but it may be worse, let's say, then you must consider alternative reasons for your pain, like a hip problem, okay? Now, is it possible that the pain can be worse because you had a hernia and you had an inadequate hernia repair where the hernia was never really fixed? Um, that's also possible. That's why imaging is so important. But you must always be open to the fact that maybe it was never your hernia to begin with. Because so now you have the original pain plus surgical pain on top of that um, in the area. I have had, no, okay, going back to the, uh, okay, you're giving me like a little bit of, <laughs> you're not giving me the whole story. This is what is important. You need to tell me the whole story. So now it turns out this patient who had pain after hernia surgery did have nerve surgery as well, uh, had neurectomy before surgery, nothing helped. So we need much more, much, much more um, information. You had neurectomy before your hernia surgery. So why do you think that it's your hernia surgery that caused your pain? Why couldn't it have been the neurectomy that went wrong and caused neuropathic pain? Or maybe it's another nerve that was missed. Um, but if you're hypersensitive in the area, that's usually a nerve pain problem. So if you want more help, please feel free to call my office directly. I do offer online consultations if you don't want to come in to see me in person or do it, or if you're not in California. Um, which is where I do, where I license to practice. And, you know, I'll try to figure it out for you. But I need a little bit more information. I'm getting little, little bits from you and I need a little bit more information. But I do like solving puzzles, like I said, so happy to help. Okay, in retromuscular or extraperitoneal mesh placement, what is the thickness of the tissue that separate mesh from the bowel? Oh, I don't know, millimeters? Is that maybe one millimeter? Depends on, depends on how much fat you have. So the peritoneum itself is super thin. It's like a piece of paper. So um, that's how thin the peritoneum is. But if you, there's also fat there. So if you have um, fat in addition to the peritoneum, then depends on how thick your fat is. Is that thickness always enough to shield the intestines from the inflammation caused by mesh? Um, uh, yes and no. If you have a lot of fat, then yes, that's usually enough to prevent a lot of inflammation transmitted from the mesh onto the uh, intestines. 
Okay, next question. We're running out of time, guys. I'll try and do as many as you can. Do you agree with Dr. David Chen that the three inguinal nerves intercommunicate and therefore triple neurectomy is necessary for pain relief despite risks of abdominal wall denervation? I do not agree with that. And we've actually discussed this. Um, I'm a proponent of um, selective neurectomy and not triple neurectomy. I do not feel that the nerves necessarily intercommunicate. Now, is there science behind the fact that they intercommunicate? Yes, they do intercommunicate. But does that mean everyone needs a triple neurectomy? No. Is that putting you at risk for abdominal wall denervation? Absolutely, especially if it's done laparoscopically or retroperitoneally. So no, I do not automatically perform triple neurectomy for everyone with pain. I only perform neurectomy if that nerve is injured or part of the problem. Um, and even then, I don't like to do neurectomies if um, I can do other forms of pain control, such as direct nerve blocks or uh, percutaneous uh, ablation of the nerves. I have published a paper on uh, outcomes from neurectomy, and in, in, in the greater literature, it's about 5% risk of neuroma. In ours, uh, we had 4% risk of neuroma, so, so very similar, slightly less, but very similar. And a certain fraction of patients will have CRPS. We ha we're going to have a, a specialist come soon to talk to us about CRPS, but CRIPS um, stands for uh, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. Very, very difficult problem. Very complicated. You do not want anyone to get CRPS. And it is a problem and a risk factor after any type of neurosurgery. So I'm very judicious about neurectomy and I do not believe that triple neurectomy is the answer to all chronic pain. Let's see. I have my mesh removed and then it was sutured up and feeling started and the feeling started after the first surgery, which is still the same. Right. So. The question is, is your feeling all neuropathic, in which case it's not a hernia issue, it's a it's a nerve issue. You gotta figure out which nerve and then what the problem is, is there a neuroma? And if it's a neuroma, then that should be uh, addressed surgically or with ablation. Oh, here's another question. Do you know of any hernia specialists in Texas? Of course. And I, um, I had my first hernia surgery in 2015 where they attacked a six by six mesh. Sorry, they tacked a six by six mesh to my pubic bone and two months later had to have another surgery because the mesh came undone. I have been in constant pain ever since. I've been told I would have to live with it. I also have been seen, sent to a psychologist because I think I'm crazy. I've heard that before um, because I keep telling them I'm in pain. I've had one other hernia surgeries since those two. I'm not crazy. I hurt and have had to quit work due to all the pain. Okay, so um, Dr. Kent Van Sickle, I believe he's in San Antonio, um, is a great surgeon in Texas. There aren't that many other specialists in Texas, unfortunately. Um, so he is the one. Uh, he's the one that um, I often refer to in Texas because he's a great guy. Uh, going back to the neurectomy patient, the doctor did neurectomy. It numbed my leg um, with a broken mesh later, I found out. I, I don't know what that means. Um, but if the area of your neurectomy is a different area than where you're currently hypersensitive, then there's a, there's a different nerve that's the issue. Let's see, after mesh implantation, is it only scar tissue that grows through the mesh so that when you remove the mesh, you only remove scar tissue or do those tissues grow back? No, actually your muscle fascia, et cetera, will ingrow into the mesh. And so when you remove mesh, whatever structure um, is close to it may also grow into it. So for example, if the mesh is placed against a vessel, then the vessel will not grow into the the mesh, let's say your external iliac vessel. However, um, if it was, okay, another example, if it was, the mesh was placed against your bladder, the mesh will not necessarily grow into the bladder. But if the bladder was invaded, 
and the mesh was placed against the muscle within the bladder wall, then yes, that muscle will grow into it. Same with the abdominal wall. If it's placed against muscle or fascia, then yes, that muscle will grow into the mesh. The fascia doesn't necessarily grow into it. It's mostly like stuck to it. Um, I had a, see that? I had a neuroma removed. Do they come back? Yes, they come back. So now you're telling me you have a neuroma. These like little details are so important. Um, yeah. Uh, so yes, if you had a neuroma, and that, depending on how that was addressed, that neuroma can come back. Like I mentioned, nerve surgery has about 4 to 5% risk of neuroma. Is it true that after mesh removal, you will never be the same as you were before mesh was implanted? Oh, we already asked, answered that question. And about the death question. Oh, that's all your questions. Oh, no, no, there's one more question. Let me go back to this. This was on Instagram, and I promised them that I would answer it. So here's the question. It says, I am five months with my mesh and I want to have another baby by the end of the year. Should I first remove it? No, 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 no. If, if you have mesh in you and you want to get pregnant, just get pregnant. Do not first remove the mesh. That would be a horrible situation. Um, now, if the mesh is in the groin, you should have no problem. If the mesh is the belly, it's possible that you're going to have pain from it, but that's not an indication to proactively um, remove the mesh. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Tofai. These sessions are almost always appreciated. Thank you for joining me. I do appreciate that you all spend your Tuesday evening, afternoon, um, wherever you are, uh, following me. And also, I do appreciate the fact that you all find this highly valuable. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to say uh, you guys are amazing people. And I do love that you love what I do because I love what I do. And, you know, it's kind of nerdy, but fun that I like hernias. And I thought the mesh removal topic went really well today because you guys asked way too many questions. Um, on that note, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Come back again next week. And we will have another great topic to talk about. We got some guests that I signed up for two weeks from now, which it's going to be super, super, super VIP. And hope that you guys um, join me then too. See you all later and take care. Bye.